<sighs> it's time to tape. That means I have to put the guitar down and go into the studio. Actually, I don't even know what today's episode might be about. Usually the IFO crew would drop me some hints, so let's see if there are any hints around. Ah, there they are. So the first hint is coat hanger. That's kind of random, isn't it? Uh, the second one is, is even more bizarre, Olympic 2000. I'm not sure how these two are related. And the final one is the shells, which is kind of I don't know, I'm clueless because shells could be the gasoline company, it could be seashells on the shore, I'm not sure. But if you guys want to guess what today's episode might be about, feel free to drop your thoughts in the comments. If you guess it correctly, you may be entitled to one of these good deed boxes from the IFO crew. For now, I'm going into the IFO nightly show set to meet our expert and to find out what today's episode might actually be about. Follow me.
I follow the sound of music to the IFO Nightly Show studio, and I was treated with a phenomenal performance by bassoonist Zui Long and accompanist Ngo Feng Vi. And later in the show, we'll get a chance to converse with Mr. Zui Long about his music career, a virtuoso in his own right. So stay tuned. So, Ng Long, it's lovely to be talking to you today. Uh, how do you feel to be on the IFO Nightly Show? Oh, thank you, Tung. It's my pleasure to be here tonight, and um, I'm feeling great. So, IFO is obviously a show about the IELTS, but it's also a show about personalities and stories of how um, outstanding, extraordinary individuals achieve their goals in life. And obviously, you have achieved mastery at your own instrument. Now you can, oh, you, you can, you can yeah. technically be called a master at your own craft. So, yes. um, you know, I, I, I don't know much about the bassoon, uh, but I would imagine that that would be a very difficult instrument to learn by simple virtue of availability. I, I don't think there were a lot of bassoon teachers or bassoon players back in the day. So could you share with us a little bit about your journey in uh, mastering your instrument? Yeah. Uh, so, as you can see, this is a bassoon. It's quite a rare instrument. And it's a baseline instrument in the symphony orchestra. Mm. I come from a, a non-musical family. Really? Yes. So, I mean, my parents, they, they love music, but they don't play anything. Okay. Yeah. But my grandfather, he plays the accordion uh. just for fun. Okay. And actually, my dad wanted to pick that instrument up professionally when uh. he was a teenager. What happened? Well, Vietnam was in the war at that time. Okay. And he was the, the oldest brother in the, in the family with eight siblings together. Uh -huh. So he couldn't, he couldn't pursue his dream. Yeah, so he, he has he to He had be to the... work with the family to yeah. earn the income, you know? Okay. But since, since my dad was a teenager until, until I was born, he, kept, he, he keeps listening to classical music because that's that's mm. what he loved, mm. you know? And that's why I was growing up listening to classical music in the morning, going to sleep with classical music. And one day I told my, my dad, I, I love it. I want to play something. Mm. But non-musical background family. Mm -hmm. we, we could only think of the piano. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was actually in the age of nine at that time. And to be honest, now it's a bit too late to pick up the piano to be a professional player. Really? Yes, it's okay. really late. Okay, just, just it's too late to play professionally, yes, but if exactly. you want to play like for fun. Anytime. Yeah, anytime, anytime in your okay. life. Yeah. <laughs> Even now. Okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. So I actually went to the Hanoi Conservatory of Music at that time for an audition. Mm -hmm. And it was really lucky that all the profess professors on the panel, they suggested me to uh, pick up the bassoon. That's kind of strange. Yes. What 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 quality did you possess I that? Mean, I mean, I had to do a talent audition. Mm -hmm. So I need to show my skill in music, like be able to play something on the piano, sing, have a good sense of rhythm, and they look at my physical requirement, whether I'm tall enough to pick up the instrument. Mm. And, and because I love music so much, I said yes. No. I didn't even know what the bassoon was at that time. <laughs> okay. I, thought, I thought it was a much smaller instrument. Okay. But then, here I am today. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just can't think of any instrument which is more suitable than the bassoon for me. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I'm very an, happy an, with the choice. And an, an instrument whose size and stature exactly. rivals your own. Yeah. <laughs> this size when I was 10 years old. Oh, it, it's the same size? The same size. The oh. same size. And I was actually the same height with the bassoon when really? I took it up. <laughs> that yes. was, uh, you, it's you, really you, funny. Like, oh, you, you all must my have, family. You must well, have some really cute like family photos. Yes, <laughs> yes, since, uh, since day one. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, so uh, what were some of the challenges uh, when learning the bassoon? Because obviously you went to the National Conservatory of Music, yes. so you probably had good teachers. Yes. So, so what were some of the difficulties in, in playing this instrument? I was really lucky because my, uh, my teacher in Vietnam, he was a very like, well-respected pro music professor. Mm. And he taught me since day one until the day that I went to Australia. Mm. Well, the instrument is quite big, so I struggled a bit at the beginning to just pick it up, bring to lessons and practice at home. And there, there was not many resources to learn the bassoon at that time. Like, I need accessory, for example, I need the reed, which you put on 
yeah. here to make a sound, you know? Same as the, with the saxophone? Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, the bassoon, you need a double reed. The saxophone, you need only one piece of reed. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's a, that's a difference. Extra cost. <laughs> Extra cost. Yeah, and I actually have to make that reed now oh. as a professional bassoon player. Really? And it takes a lot of time. Yeah, one third of my time playing the bassoon is making reed. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're both a musician and a craftsman. <laughs> yes, exactly. You need to learn that in order to play the bassoon well. Okay, that, yeah. that's uh, something very particular that yes. I never anticipated about this instrument. Yes. So uh, you've spent a fair amount of time in Sydney and New South Wales. Uh, would you say that your experience of living in this region of uh, Australia inspire or if, uh, influence your interest in music somehow? Yes, I mean... At first, the plan was only three years. Mm. Yeah, and obviously some, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> and somehow it turned into twelve years because I finished my study altogether, and then I, I ended up teaching and playing in the professional orchestra. Oh. And throughout all the experiences, I. I find that, in Australia, they actually love classical music a lot, mm. and. And everyone knows to play something. Yeah. Right? Since they. Uh, they at school since a very young age. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I pick up many things while I was there. Yeah. yeah. yeah but when I, when I, I, I kind of saw the same pattern when I was in the United States yeah. and I, I went to high school there. And uh, being able to play an instrument yeah. uh, is not, you know, it, you don't stand out as much. Mm. It, it's a very social skill. Yeah because everyone around you knows how to play something or, or at least knows how to appreciate yes. music. Yes. You know, even if they don't play an instrument, they have like really good taste in music, you know, and so it's a very good entryway to, you know, creating relationships, right? And um, as a musician, you know, you, you uh, mentioned in passing that you were teaching yes. the bassoon at the conservatorium yeah, uh, I was, as well? Yeah, I actually, like, I had student at the conservatorium high school mm. and at many private school in Sydney. Mm. Like my student goes from primary school up until end of year 12 when you have an option to do music for your high school certificate. Mm. And I had students who continue to study bassoon professionally at the tertiary level. Wow, you changed their lives. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Well, it, is a, it is a huge privilege. Yeah, and I'm very proud of that. Like within six or seven years of teaching, mm -hmm. I actually pass my love of music to, to many students and that's, that, that's something I'm so proud of. Yeah, that's an incredible feeling. And, and were you playing shows at, uh, yes. in Sydney as well? Yes, and uh, when I first came to Sydney with my mom, we actually joking about one day I could play at the Sydney Opera House. Mm. Yeah, I even got the, my mom saying that in front of the Opera House when we went there for sightseeing. And uh, I'm so I'm just so glad that after I finished my Bachelor of Music, I got the chance to play with both professional orchestra at the Sydney Opera House, the Opera Australia Orchestra and the Sydney Symphony. And I played with them until two weeks before I, I moved back to Vietnam. Oh, wow. And that was a very long journey. I learned a lot as, okay. as a musician. And I learned a lot to be able to to do something with the music education in general. Must have been an incredible, like full circle moment when you come back to the opera house and you actually play there. I know, I, I it's can't. just like dream come true and yeah. the dream lasts for like years. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but why didn't you stay in Sydney? Why did you come back to Vietnam? Yes, I mean, I know three years. I know it's not the virus because you came back like no, way before. I, yes, I came back before that, a few months before the virus. Yeah. Yeah, I was always thinking about moving back to Vietnam one day, to be honest. Yeah, but I just didn't know when. But then in 2019, I was offered a full-time job in the very quite a new symphony orchestra in Vietnam, very international, the Sun Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I study, I work, I play, I taught. And I, I thought at that time, well, now I have some experiences. Maybe, maybe I should bring those experiences back home to do something meaningful, to help the, the young student like me when I was young. I always needed someone to guide me and I was really lucky with that. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought it's my responsibility 
to pass that on yeah. to the next generation of music students in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So that's the main reason why I, I moved back. The full-time job and to move back to do something I love, to inspire people mm -hmm. as much as I can. Yeah. yeah. And uh, obviously now you are here and you've been teaching for quite a while. Uh, what would you say is something unique from the Australian music education background that you were able to impart to the Vietnamese uh, audience? So I was really lucky that I, I had to, I had the chance to attend many concerts at the Sydney Opera House. And the, the concert hall of the Sydney Opera House has nearly 3,000 seats. Mm. And every single, like nearly every single concert are full, is full with yeah. audience. And that's something I'm, I was quite amazed with that. Mm -hmm. But then I, I started thinking. I look at the, the generation of the audience. They, they're in their 60s and 70s, mainly. Mm -hmm. And then when I got a chance to teach, I see young students in Australia, they get to play musical instrument at their own school at a very young age mm -hmm. with all the professional teachers mm -hmm. on the instrument. So I realized that's a really nice circle. You learn to play musical instrument when you're young. You don't have to be professional. Like obviously you want to do something else. Mm -hmm. But then you have the knowledge. So you may listen to different kind of music from your 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 50 to 60, and then, and then when it comes to, I mean, a little bit older age, mm -hmm. you may want to switch to enjoy something more calm, mm -hmm. less Less movement, I say, like, yeah, yeah, compared yeah. to if you go to the pop concert, you need to yell and, yeah. and enjoy something the that music you with can... friends. But then at that age, you have the knowledge that you've been prepared since mm. young. So you can actually pre appreciate what the professional musician doing on the stage. Mm -hmm. and I think that, that is so great. Thank you, Ang Long, for a very uh, inspiring no talk. Uh, because uh, initially, um, you know, as, a, as someone who plays music myself, it's always interesting to hear stories of how other people kind of, um, you know, discover um, a love and a passion for their own instrument and, and the journey that they have undergone to master their own craft. So that's really inspiring. And, and it, it's even more empowering that you're passing on your knowledge to the next generation. Right. And for viewers of the IFO Nightly Show, don't go anywhere because in the next segment of the show, you're going to talk to an also an extremely talented guest who also studied in New South Wales and who shared a passion with music with uh, our guest Ang Lam here today. So stay tuned and watch this video to find out who our guest is. Hello, I am Ming Bera. I did my MBA at Harvard University in America, but not many people know that. Before that, I actually spent four years in Australia doing my undergrad study at Sydney University. And I had a fantastic time there. Now, I'm a business person. I'm the founder and CEO at Beta Group. My motto in life is that you would never be perfect, but what matters more is that you keep working to get better and better at it. I'm so excited to be here and share with you my experience and stories today. I hope that you enjoy the show. Thank you. So after the video, I'm sure the most devout fans of IFO will be no stranger to our guest today. Please join me in giving Mr. Quang Ming a hearty homecoming welcome. Please. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm, I'm pretty good. You look dashing as ever. Thank you. Please be seated. All right. <laughs> it's good to see you too. I wasn't here in the first season, but I'm here now. So yeah. uh, how does it feel for you to return to IFO after a six-season hiatus? Still very exciting to be back here. Okay. Um, Obviously, we have a new set. Yeah. You know? Amazing. Yeah, up, very up, nice. Up in the studio game. Yeah. So uh, a lot has changed with IFO in the past, you know, five years. Mm -hmm. So what's changed in your life? Uh, not much. I think um, I got older. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you age very well. You age like a fine wine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a lot of new projects that okay. I have been uh, working on uh, that came to uh, fruitation. Um, things are happening quite quite well for me. 
Um, everything in life is going well. My English got a little bit worse, though. Oh, because, wow. You know, because I haven't had a chance to speak English as often as before. So it's safe to assume that the projects that you've involved yourself in in the past five years uh, mostly take place in Vietnam? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what have you been up to? Uh, so last time I came here, I was working on a cinema chain, so that business grew quite nicely. Okay. Uh, we have uh, 15 locations in Vietnam at the moment. Um, and we are still looking to expand the business uh, quite aggressively in the coming years. Okay. And I have been working on other ventures as well. Okay. Um, the most recent one being a prop tech startup mm. that I'm very passionate about. Um, we're trying to bring like affordable living solution for young Vietnamese people, okay. like a new co-living idea uh, with um, technology. Okay, so it's, it's the new Airbnb. Uh, yeah, but it's for long-term stay. Oh, you know okay, how it's for young, long-term stay. Yeah, yeah. You know how like young Vietnamese people, a lot of people when they um, migrate from smaller provinces to big cities like Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, mm. spend a lot of time studying, working really hard, and get a job to stay in the big city. But their living condition is not um, is not that great yet. Yeah. Given the budget that they can spend for their living, um, okay. yeah, solution. So what what are we trying to do is to to provide them with a, a better solution for the same uh, budget. Yeah. And um, I mean, you have spent an extended amount of time studying in other countries and you've, very, uh, you've been very successful with like, gaining scholarships in, in, in your own academic journey. Mm -hmm. So could you share with us a little bit about the scholarship that you got to go to uh, Australia to study? Uh, it was called OZET. Oh, okay. So it was granted uh, to me by the Australian government. Mm. I think it's like a, a support uh, from the Australian government for Vietnamese people for us to be able to go to Australia, experience an advanced education and go back to Vietnam and contribute. After I finished, I went back to Asia. Okay. So I was actually working in Singapore for a few years before I came back to Vietnam and started my first venture, mm -hmm. uh, Doko Donuts. After that, I did get a scholarship, but I didn't go to Australia again. I went to America mm. for my master degree. Okay. And uh, so what exactly is it that you were studying in Australia? I study for actually three majors. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> At the same time? <laughs> yeah, because actually usually people can have one or up to two um, majors in one degree. But I took extra credit just so I can have another one. Okay. So I majors in agriculture economics. Economics and finance. Oh, okay. Uh, they they seem okay. There there is a common thread of like yes. uh, economics and finance, but why agricultural economics? Because I see a lot of people are are starting to get interested in ag agricultural economics now, yeah. but back in the day, you know, they weren't so interested. So, what kind of catalyzed your decision? Uh, it actually an, an advice from my father. Mm. I was looking into different options, and my father told me that I should seriously consider agriculture economics because Vietnam is a, is a major agriculture country. Mm -hmm. And so he saw, he foresees that, you know, in the future there might be a lot of opportunities for me to work with agriculture products. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I felt like, you know, it's, it's actually quite unique and interesting. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm less a, competition. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a greedy person myself oh, as well. Okay. So I was like, okay, I, so I might do that, but I also could do other things. Oh, yeah. And that's why I took extra credit, just so I can finish all the majors that I'm interested in. Okay. So our other special guest uh, on today's IFO Nightly Show also shared a passion with Ang Ming uh, for music. And we're going to invite him back as a fellow resident of New South Wales for um, you know, a fair number of years to talk about the Sydney experience. So don't go anywhere. Stay tuned for this interesting story. Let's take a break with IFO Facts. Do you know that out of 43 universities in Australia, New South Wales is home to 11 states? including University of Sydney, Australia's oldest university, established in 1850. The university has a vast history, covering many aspects of intellectual, scientific and socio-political life in Australia. Sydney is the major innovation hub in the Southern Hemisphere, where innovators are celebrated and supported by business and government. More than 200 of Australia's top 500 companies are based in New South Wales. The dynamic business environment 
offers ample work experience and employment opportunities for international students. Welcome back. Now I am joined by both guests of the IFO Nightly Show. This is a rare treat. And I've been to Sydney before, but both of our guests have spent way, way longer time in Sydney than I have. So I'm going to test whether they actually know the city or not. Uh, I have prepared here a, a series, a, a questionnaire, just some rapid fire questions. And I call this game the five second rule. No, you don't have to pick up food from the floor and eat it. <laughs> this is, this is just, I'm going to give you a question, uh, each of you a question, and in five seconds, I want you to tell me as much about the question as possible. Okay? Okay. We're cool? We have six questions, so three for each. Okay. All right, so the first question goes out to Mr. Long. You ready? Five seconds. Name a popular summer sport in Sydney. Surfing. That's like a year-round sport in Sydney. <laughs> kind of I mean, <laughs> yes, lots of people do that in winter, but come on, it's it's really like okay, okay, I'll, a popular I'll give you summer that one. sport. I'll give yes. you that one. Okay. So the next question <laughs> is from Mr. Ming. Yeah. I want you to give me more than one, as many as possible in oh. five seconds. Okay, not not just one. Okay, because this is this is an easy question. Name not one, but a few popular beaches in Sydney. Okay, Bondi Beach. Kanji, Manly. Sorry. Oh, that's, 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 that's three. <laughs> that, that's two more than I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, question number three for Mr. Long. Name a couple of popular sightseeing sports in uh, sightseeing spots in Sydney. The Sydney Opera House, the Blue Mountains, and of course all the beautiful beaches that uh, Mr. Ming has mentioned. Number four for Mr. Ming. Name a few popular colleges in Sydney. Sydney University, UTS, uh, University of New South Wales. All right, so uh, UTS is short for? University of Technology, Sydney. Okay, pretty cool. Okay, number five. Uh, Sydney is obviously a foodie city, so I want, you, I want you to name me five popular restaurants in Sydney. Forget the five seconds rule. Okay. Five popular restaurants, go. I think in this question, I would need help from you and, and Ming oh, as okay. well. Okay, I, I can pitch it. We, we could pitch it like restaurant yeah, sure. recommendations, yes. Yeah, because <laughs> I'll go first McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Very popular. All right, so he got the fast food. Okay, we, we, we can't name fast food restaurants. <laughs> I, I don't want to continue with like KFC or anything. <laughs> okay, final question. Okay. This, this one is kind of weird. I was just given this okay. list of questions. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how to make sense of it. Yeah, right. Blame your producer. <laughs> <laughs> What are the main languages spoken in Sydney? Okay, English, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean somewhere. Okay. okay. Lebanese. Yes. Lebanese. Lebanese. Indian as well. Yeah, Indian for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it's a very multicultural, multilingual city. You can Absolutely. like walk through a neighborhood and hear multiple tongues. Yes, spoken and even uh, if you go to like certain area in Sydney, they even have the size in both like for example, English and Vietnamese at the same time. Okay. If you go to the Vietnamese town. Oh man. So this. So it's it's like a very accessible city. Like even if you don't know like a ton of English, if you go to Sydney, you probably survive. So obviously, when it comes to Australia, there's a diverse range of courses so you can roll yourself in. There's a bunch of schools. Uh, it's a premier overseas study uh, destination. But, you know, obviously it's overseas and given the current, you know, COVID restrictions, it's going to be difficult for students to go to Australia to study. So, so what are some of the alternatives? I mean, many universities in Australia offer online courses. Mm. But it happens to me that the Western University of Sydney, they have a campus in Ho Chi Minh City. Mm -hmm. That could be a really great option for students here. Mm -hmm. to maybe spend the first few years in Vietnam and then transfer to finish all the courses in Australia. Mm. 
Yeah, so that could be one great option for for this time of the of the year, you know. Yeah, and it's like the same system, so you don't exactly have to worry about you know whether your credits get transferred yes. or not, you know. So that's by the going same uni in Australia, I think. Yeah, so it's just like a very seamless experience. Uh, do you have any other resources that you can point mm. the students towards? Um, so somebody told me about a website called Study in Australia. Mm -hmm. So it's like a portal where you can access all the information about what is available and there are options for you to study online as well as looking for offline locations that are close to you. Mm. I think it's a great resource. Okay, so um, either study at a, a Vietnamese campus of an Australian institution or go to studyinaustralia.com or dot studyinaustralia.gov.au Okay. So, I mean, if it says golf there, it must be official. Right? <laughs> it must be legit. <laughs> it must be legit. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's a bunch of resources you can kind of refer to before you go to Australia. So do your research because there's a bunch of ways for you to get the experience of Australian education. So thank you both very much for an insightful conversation about what Sydney is like as a study destination. And in return, uh, we're going to give you, we've prepared a very special gift for you both. Oh. So are you ready to meet the IFO band? Please. I was so high, did not recognize Fire burning in her eyes The chaos that control my mind Whisper goodbye She got on a plane Never to return again But always in my heart Oh, this love has taken its toll on me She said goodbye Too many times before Try my best to keep her appetite Keep her coming every night So hard to keep her satisfied Keep playing love like it was just a game Pretending to feel the same I Turn around and live again oh, oh, oh. This love has taken its toll on me She said on your hips, sinking my fingertips, never inch of you, cause I know this one you want me to do, this love has taken its toll on me, she said goodbye to many times before, uh, and her heart is breaking in front of me, and I have no choice, cause I gon' say goodbye. Wow, thank you for your applause. <laughs> Someone said at the age of 18, everything is possible and tomorrow looks hopeful. That's why in this very episode, Eiffel Band wants to pick a song that reminds our impeccable, handsome two guesses of their sweet 18. 
As you can see, this is shaping up to be the most musical episode yet in the history of IFO. I'm inclined to not call it an IO show with music, but a music show with IELTS. But stay tuned because more great music is coming your way. And for now, it's the IFO challenge. challenge and all of our guests today are obviously very musically adept virtuosos in their own craft and we have our own musical genius here from the IFO band so obviously the IFO challenge is going to involve music the rule is simple our in-house musical genius is going to play uh, an instrumental version of some of the very popular songs and you guys are going to write down that board uh, what song you think it is and when I say Hold up the board, then you hold up the board uh, to show the viewers the answers. Are you guys ready? Yep. Okay, please make it difficult. Make it easy, please. <laughs> <laughs> First song, go. Oh, oh no, yeah, right, yeah, right, right, right now, right now. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you play this, this part right away? <laughs> okay, hold up the board, please. I mean, I wanted to say, I wanted to write out the singer name. Which I, is? You, you write Jones. out the singer name. Nora Jones. Name. Okay. <laughs> who, who is he or who is she? She. Oh, it's a she. Okay. Yes. And it's? Is that Nora Jones? <laughs> is it the right spelling? Oh, okay. No. Who's, who's the singer? Who's the singer? Alicia Keys. It's oh Alicia my God. Keys. <laughs> okay. I'm a classical but, musician. But, but in, in the same way. Close. Very close. Very yes. close. All right. Okay. Now, the second song on the IFO challenge, please. Okay, I know this one. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I know this one, yeah. <laughs> Did you write it down? I just, can't, I just can never remember the name. Yeah, the names usually is hard to remember names. The melody you can remember, right? There we go. I'm, I'm going to write out the name of the band it's again. Yeah, yeah, if you got the name of the band, you can do that. You can write the name of the band. If you know it's a band, I think it's probably correct. Is it? Okay, All right. Yeah, yeah. All you right. can write down the name of the band. Okay. You got it? Oh, oh and I got the name of the song as well. Oh, really? <laughs> I mean, from, from, from the first song, Why I don't you... think you do. <laughs> but, uh, just to be safe, okay. Okay, I got the wrong uh, name of the band. Now I got the <laughs> correct name okay. of the Okay, what do you write down, Metallica? <laughs> okay, please hold up the boards, please. Yeah, it's close to you. Okay, finally we can agree on something. <laughs> okay. The Carpenter or something. The That's Carpenters. the name of the, the band. The, the Carpenters. The Carpenters. Yes. Yeah. All right, third song. Yeah, come on. Give us a little more. <laughs> come on, you know this one. <laughs> he got it, he got it. Got oh, it. yeah, I got it. <laughs> okay, please hold up the board, please. Okay, and this round goes to uh, Mr. Long. <laughs> For, for a classically trained musician, you're very adept. I mean, I, I know the I know the arranger. Yeah, he's, you know the arranger? He's my good friend in high school. Oh, <laughs> obviously. You probably heard this song before anyone else. <laughs> okay, so the fourth one, please. Uh, uh, a global smash hit. Oh, wow. A global smash hit. You guys got to know this one. Mm. Let's see if you can <laughs> see if you can obscurify <laughs> this very net recognizable tune. Okay, with the chords now. <laughs> I, can't, I, I don't know the correct spelling, but I'm just going to say it, it's it It's fine. You can, you can write it in the basic one. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't remember. <laughs> is it the correct name? 
Senorita? Oh, yeah. <laughs> senorita, okay. <laughs> so I remember the melody, but I couldn't. Okay, so it, it, it's two for two. Wow. Okay, so I think the first two <laughs> rounds, it's safe to say it goes to Mr. Ming, and the, the subsequent two rounds goes to Mr. Long. So we have one tiebreaker. This is going to be a very ubiquitous song in COVID times. Mm. All right, so take it away. He's, he's thinking about... He's trying to make it hard. <laughs> he's trying I mean, COVID is hard enough already. Don't make it harder. I mean, COVID is hard enough already. Don't make it harder. <laughs> Okay. It sounds like a song from my childhood, but it's not. It's very recent. <laughs> it's actually, uh, it's, it sounds Vietnamese, but I don't know. It sounds very Vietnamese. Oh. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, you, you should know this one. <laughs> He was, he was faking it the first time. No, no, I was not because it didn't sound familiar. The yet. way you thought it would sound. No, no, until he plays the later part, then I can recognize it. Okay. The first time he plays it is weird. Just say. <laughs> okay, so could you hold up the board? <laughs> Nothing for me. Yeah, it's my song. Oh, <laughs> it's his song, obviously. You would you see, that, I, that I heard it many times on TV. Yeah, because uh, the way that he plays it at the beginning, I think he, he's like, it's a remix. Okay, so it's like a Vina, Vina Hay remix. <laughs> kidding, Vina kidding, it's not. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Ming, for the very first time ever, anywhere, could you please uh, join the IFO band in performing a very special, unique, unplugged version of Vietnam Oi? Also unprepared. Unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> very impromptu. Okay. okay. Cool. Let's do that. Yeah. And Long, you know, why don't you, you join in with us? Yeah, sure. Even though my instrument is mainly for classical music, but I'm gonna try my best today. Yes, please. Get yeah. your get get your axe. Where's your weapon of choice? <laughs> okay. Yes. Sure. Cool. Let's do it. All right. Exciting. <laughs> Cuộc sống đang tươi xanh thì bỗng có Covid Dân ta lao đao rồi đi ra đi vào lòng lo lắng Rất xa Bình tĩnh luôn giữa tay Vệ sinh kỹ khắp nơi ở quanh mình Và giữ ý thức nhà Vượt qua gian khó Việt Nam mơ Đừng share chuyện sai trên Facebook Phải đeo khẩu trang cho đông lúc Đừng kỳ thị ai văn minh vì dân lành mình Kẻ thù nào ta không chiến thắng Chiều người ngày đêm đang cố gắng Một vòng tay nói chọn Việt Nam Yêu thương cuộc đời tin nơi con người Đừng sợ nhé chúng ta vượt qua hết Đất nước của mình Bao nhiêu ân tình Việt Nam không bỏ lại trong tiếng che thơ đùa vui cười và nắng trên lá reo ngày xanh tươi một việt nam sáng tươi từ nơi đồng xanh thơm hương lúa về nơi nhà cao xe sắp phố và một niềm tin reo ca e o hết ồ từ nơi đào xa mênh mông sông về nơi đồi cao bay mây trắng một vòng tay nơi chọn việt nam bao la đất trời
Việt Nam ơi Tự hào hát mãi lên Việt Nam ơi We had a chance to talk to two incredible guests and enjoy performances from not only the IFO band but from our phenomenal guests as well. I hope you guys have had a blast. I certainly have. And until next time, this is IFO Nightly Show. Good night. Welcome back everyone, my name is Chang Yong and this is IFO Backstage. So sitting right next to me here is um, the first guest of this episode. So hello Ang Zui Long, nice to meet you. Hello I am, nice to meet you too. Yeah, so um, you chose music as your way and um, I really want to ask you why. I mean, uh, how did you know that it was going to work right from the beginning or you just uh, didn't know and just follow your heart? I mean, I listened to classical music a lot when I was young because that was my dad's love since he was a teenager. So I went to sleep and uh, waking up in classical music and the sounds just got so familiar with me. And one day I, I told my parents I wanted to play something, something got to do with classical music, you know. Oh. And, uh, and your parents also supported uh, your, your one to go to abroad for like um, studying music? Yes, they... They gave me all the support that they could, and I'm so grateful with that. Wonderful, great parents. So could you tell us more about um, your opportunities when you, uh, when you got a chance to go to Australia for studying music and probably your most memorable performance as a child? Yes, there were so many great memories in, uh, in Australia. And just to name a few, I actually got the chance to went on tour with the with the school orchestra, the Sydney Conservatorium of Music Orchestra to uh, the USA, Germany. In the USA, we got to play with top, top class students from the Juilliard School. And in 2014, I was really lucky to successfully audition for the, the Pacific Music Festival in Japan. And that was one of the music festivals that I dream of when I was a student in Vietnam. Oh my gosh, amazing. Yeah. Seems like you've been to so many countries. Do you rem remember like how many countries have you been to? Most of the country I visited got to do with music and bassoon, like the USA, Germany, Japan, Thailand, Vietnam, New Zealand, Australia, of course. Yeah. So many, so many. So many. Wow. Um, so I, I remember that you also got a scholarship right, to yes. study in Australia. So as someone who have already uh, got a scholarship like that, do you have any tips to your audience on how to get a scholarship to study abroad, uh, especially in Australia? I mean, in the field of music, you need to do an audition mm -hmm. and you, you need to prepare and play at your best and wish for luck. At the Conservatory of Music, when I was a student there, there were actually many scholarships for, for every student. Not just for the bassoon, for piano, violin. Many people got scholarships just based on their performance when they, when they do an audition. So my, my tip is, this is the, actually the advice for music students in general, that they should start playing music early. Practice and listen to music as much as they can. Go to concerts and try to find opportunities to perform because you need to learn from all the mistakes or all the great things that happens in a performance. Wonderful. So music lovers, you know what you got to do. Uh, so to wrap, mm, to wrap this section up very quickly, do you want to say something um, probably motivational to our audience who probably haven't found their passion or they have found it, but they do not have the gut to follow it until the end like uh, you are doing. So do you have something to say to them to follow their passion? 
Yes, because what I do is, well, what I do has something to do with passion, of course. So my great, not great, but my, my advice come from my personal experience is, if you want to do something, you should do it with the love from your heart and do it with good will and success will come to you. Wow, that, comes from, that comes from my personal experience because I love music and I strongly believe that I could, I could do it and I can use it to inspire people. So if you really love and trust what you do, then you don't have to worry about anything else. Right, amazing. I think that's a great advice. Love what you do and trust what you do. Anyway, thank you so much for joining the show. And I think this is going to be a very interesting episode in which um, our, our audience will learn a lot, not only about music, but also other aspects of um, living and studying in Australia. Um, thank you so much again. And um, really hope you lots of luck on your road to success. Thank you, Yung. What's up guys, it's me again, Chan Yong, and you're watching IFO Backstage live at the studio. So today we have not only one guest, but two very special guests who are masters as their field. And let's go to meet the first guest. Hello, Ming. Hi, Chan Hi, Yong, how nice are you? you? Nice meeting you. Very fine. Uh, so I know that you've been on IFO before, right? Mm. So how does it feel to be back after six years? It's very nice to be back and meeting, you know, some familiar faces and some new ones. Um, always happy to be back here. Um, so what is the thing that you love the most about a new season? Probably um, our house or our new decorations with the format. What's the thing um, that you like? I feel a new energy to it, mm -hmm. right? Like it's a lot more energetic. It's a lot fresher. Um, and I feel like I can be um, just casual in the show, which I like. More comfortable, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so to be honest, I was actually shocked looking at your profile. So you graduated from Harvard and um, you're also an artist, a uh, producer, and CEO. I mean, how can you manage the time to do all of that? It's kind of impossible. <laughs> uh, I think the key is to enjoy what I do um, and, and also having a lot of people helping me out in the journey. Um, we can never do anything alone. It's always yeah, about it's having the right team, the right support the right system to, to help me to get things done. Yeah, people always say that uh, if you want to go far, you got to have um, your favorite team with you, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that uh, you, in terms of your music, you had a hit called Vietnam and yeah. you just perform it live on the stage. Yeah, lovely. Uh, like, were you nervous to perform it live like that? And it was a COVID version, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a mix between the COVID version and the original one. Oh. Yeah, um, no, I was not nervous. I mean, when I was younger, when I had to perform live without a lot of practice, I could get quite nervous. But nowadays, you know, I, I think I know it's just about having fun and giving it, you know, my best. Well, you've really grown a lot and I really love your confidence. Uh, so could I ask, like, how was the context like when you wrote that song? I mean, mm. uh, what was the, uh, what was your initial purpose of writing that song? Yeah, so um, I was about to go to America to do my MBA. So it was 2011 and I was about to leave Vietnam. I didn't know whether I would return to Vietnam afterwards or not. So, you know, I got really emotional about that. And I, I thought about the country, the nation, the people that I grew up with here in Vietnam. And, you know, j j the song just came to me and I finished it in, in like 30 minutes. Really? Yeah. 30 minutes and it became like uh, a nationwide hit. Yeah, I mean, it's a surprise for me as well. I, I didn't know that it would catch on and become such a, such a big hit. Yeah, I, I'm very grateful for the love that I have for it. Well, I guess emotions is the best catalyst for mm. writing a song. Yeah. Um, I feel like when I hear that song, it's kind of like a roses in me, the patriotism and the national pride is really amazing. Uh, so in terms of um, academic, uh, I know that you also won a full ride scholarship to study in Australia. So no, to uh, to go to America for my MBA. To yeah, oh. I took uh, OSLET for for my Australian study. Oh, yeah. I got it. 
Thank you so much for joining the show. It's really an honor to have you here. And I think you're really an outstanding example that the young generation should follow. Um, anyway, I really hope that I'm gonna um, see you again on the show someday and see uh, what surprises you got to offer us. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you, Chang Yu. Thank you, and uh, see you in the show. Goodbye. Another reason to keep me watching IFO Nightly Show to the end on YouTube is the vocabulary highlight segment. And this time, I begged Chang Yong to pass the role of guiding you through the magical words that our host and guests used in this episode. Even before the talk show, Dung Dang generously gave us some useful words. He mentioned that he was clueless, which meant he did not know who the guests would be. So we have the adjective clueless. I'm clueless about the content of IFO Nightly Show Episode 4. He also said that the one who makes the right guess about the content of Episode 3 may be entitled to one of the goodie boxes. We have the phrase to be entitled to something, which means to deserve something. A nice synonym of talk with is to converse with. As Tung Dang said, that we'll get a chance to converse with Mr. Zui Long. During the talk, he also mentioned that being able to play an instrument, you don't stand out as much. To stand out means to be very noticeable. We also have the adjective outstanding, which means excellent. Your performance in the speaking test was outstanding. To have a good taste in music means to have good choices of music. And it is obvious that Tung Dang himself has a good taste in fashion. He said to Zui Long, you're passing on your knowledge to the next generation. That means Zui Long is transferring or giving his knowledge to the younger artists and students. Our forefathers passed on their patriotism to young Vietnamese today. Zui Long, our guest, also gave us some easy to remember but valuable expressions. First, we need to pronounce his instrument right. It's bassoon with double S and double O. Zui Long also said his father couldn't pursue his dream. It basically means to follow his dream. He also described his teacher as a well-respected music professor. The adjective well-respected means highly admired. Ming Beta, our second guest, also talked about his father as someone who foresees. To foresee means to know about something before it happens. So, can you foresee what will be on the next episode of IFO Nightly Show? Drop your thoughts in the comments. Chang Yong and I will be joining you in the vocab highlight section very soon.